Trial Bridge is the product of Daniel Knight's true and abiding love for Terry Pratchett's word. Given manifest destiny by a princely sum of $120 by myself. <laughs> Others may have contributed a little bit, but it's mostly my $120. <laughs> USD. The film has become possible through me taking out a, a loan from, from one of the banks here, because I, I, I knew that such a venture would be definitely worth it. But it's, it's, it's become possible through the, the wonderful world of the internet and sponsorship. Um, we've had quite a number of people that have loved the idea of us doing the project and have sponsored us money, usually around $30 Australian. In compensation, what we're going to do when the film is completed, we're going to be sending them off a DVD of the, of the film. They're not buying the DVD. What it is, it's a free DVD that we're sending them. Um, they, can see this, they can see the film at other things like Discord conventions or other conventions which are being held in the States, etc. Thanks to the sponsors, we've been able to make this film possible. Thank you, sponsors. Uh, he said, if you can give me 250 people and give me $30, we can make this film. Um, seems like a good idea, I gave him the $30, uh, and I've been following it ever since. I could give $20 to Trollbridge, or I could give $20 to the convention. Mm. And it was like, I'm going to give it to the convention, because oh. <laughs> I thought it had more chance of happening. <laughs> Shh, don't tell Dad. We had a funding drive way before Kickstarter was even thought of, and we managed to raise $5,000 on that. And I was basing that funding drive off what the Broken Allegiance guys did to produce a sequel. They were able to raise some capital, and I thought, well, maybe we should try and do the same thing. I thought, well, we can make Troll Bridge for $5,000. That's a hugely expensive film. $5,000 was a hell of a lot of money for me back then. Um, it's still a hell of a lot of money for me now, to be honest. The commitment to the backers was the number one reason we didn't drop it, and like we've considered dropping it on a number of occasions. But at which point, then you've got to start talking about, well, then we need to refund people. Of course, the money has already been spent, so we either need to raise the money to be able to pay people back, or we raise more money and make continue making the film. Um, to help raise money for the film, Daniel actually auctioned a vial of his blood at one of the disc world conventions and not only auction it but he had it collected in front of an audience with a nurse attending but ask him about how he suffered for his art so after we shot the uh, the, the war scene um, things got a little bit difficult there for a while. We had some amazing footage and we knew we were sitting on some really uh, uh, dynamite stuff. But every time, uh, I guess, we kind of looked at the road ahead, the challenges seemed quite insurmountable um, in terms of the, the resources that we were going to require. We approached several funding bodies that are in Melbourne. Uh, we've got Screen Australia and um, Film Victoria. They're the two prominent ones that are at least relevant for us. And we thought, oh, OK, well, once the war scene's done, then we can go to the funding bodies and show them the war scene and they can fund the rest of the film. So we went to Screen Australia and we took the project to them, we took the, the, the battle sequences that we've shot and a bunch of other material and we presented it to them and they were blown away. They, they were simply, you know, their jaws dropped when they saw how beautiful this was and what people were actually had already achieved with very limited means. And they say, that's great, we want to continue making that film for you, we want to finalise that for you. And we went, great, cool, well here's the script, this is what we need to shoot to make Troll Bridge. And they said, no, no, you can't shoot anything new. We'll give you money to finalize what you've shot. And we're like, no, 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 that was just to get your attention. We haven't shot the film yet. The film is, is this other, it doesn't have a war sequence in it. The film is actually about this, these two old guys on the edge of a bridge having a nap. Like that should be simple to shoot. Can, can you fund that? And they, they weren't interested. They wanted, to, they wanted the war scene to be the film which is obviously absurd knowing everything that I've just said now it's uh, yeah is that because they could only offer post-production funding or or is that just because that was the film that they were now interested in if I knew what went on in the minds of the funding bodies I'd be utilizing them
And then uh, Daniel um, pulled me over one day and said that he'd been uh, hearing about some people engaged in crowdfunding activities um, and that some other fan films had been using this as, as, as a way to kind of uh, raise the revenue to go out and, and make the film that they wanted to make. One of our actor friends, Tim Ferriss, he came over with a whole heap of newspaper cuttings that he'd been done about, uh, it was either Born for Hope or Hunt for Gollum which had made um, the newspapers and they had managed to raise a significant amount of money on not Kickstarter, I think they just did it via their own channels, but Kickstarter was, emer was emerging at that point um, and was becoming very, very, very prominent. So he stood up, he talked about Trollbridge and then he explained that he'd signed up with a website called Kickstarter and with that people could pledge money. Now the deal was he set out how much he needed to raise, which was 45,000. If he didn't get 45,000 in pledges, then everybody got their money back, he got nothing. You know, I, I remember Dan called me and asked me if I was interested and I, I had never heard of Terry Pratchett at the time. Oh. I know, I know. I was doing a tour of Cozzy around Australia with a, a theatre company and um, I mentioned it to one of the young guys in the cast and he said, Terry Pratchett, oh my God! And he went out and bought me three Terry Pratchett yeah. books and I read them and I went, oh my God! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I rang Dan back and said, I'm in, you know, because I just love the humour, the characters, the humanity. In all honesty, Kickstarter is our last hope for getting Trollbridge made. I've been working on this project now solidly for eight years um, in some form or another uh, and it's reached a point for us in Snowgun Films that we either have to make this film and get this film completed once and for all or we have to drop it entirely. I'm sweating. I'm fucking sweating. We knew we only had one chance at this. Um, you know, this was, this was kind of our, our, our Hail Mary pass. We needed to hit it. I honestly thought that, I thought there was a very good chance that that was going to be the, the end of Drawbridge. Um, and just, uh, I guess coming to terms that I was going to have to let go of it and move on with the rest of my life. We crunched some, some math and worked out that we could um, you know, build the set that we needed um, and hire the appropriate equipment to build Trollbridge. Um, we had some stuff in the budget for uh, traveling to a regional Victoria for doing some of the, 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 the snow in the exterior locations. Um, but we thought about $40,000 should, should probably about get us, uh, you know, get us the shots that we needed. Hello, my name's Daniel Knight, and I'd like to talk to you about the last eight years of my life. I call those eight years Trollbridge. Damn! Where are we? Yes, I'm working on that. Look, we, we put a lot of thought into that pitch video. I, I think it was something where we needed to be able to convey to uh, you know, a wide audience what it was we wanted to achieve. We knew we wanted to be able to present Cohen as he would appear in the film. We really wanted to get that right. So we spent a lot of time on the makeup. And in the end, I think that that was one of the things that, that really sold it. And, and Don's obviously an amazing actor and he just, just fell into that role. It was just brilliant the way he pulled it off. I think we are in a vacuum of unrealised potentiality. I heard a wizard talk about it once. But we exist. Perhaps they only had the budget for us. What? <laughs> no, I, I couldn't ever see myself playing a barbarian. I've played a lot of things in my life. Um, kangaroos, uh, coke cans, but yeah, a barbarian wasn't something I I actually saw myself as. Perhaps the, the creator is on limited resources. You know, like when you run out of milk or something. Is that why I'm invisible? No, you're not invisible. That's what I've been saying. You, you just don't exist yet. Perhaps a talking horse was too much for them at this point. I'm a horse. Yes. 
Upon seeing photos of Don Bridges and putting it up against again Kidby's artwork, it just seems like the right choice. You can you can see this guy with diamond teeth. You can see him with uh, with a talking horse on a bridge talking to a troll, and he just looks like Cohen. We spent I think it was a three hour makeup the first time, so it was just fascinating watching it gradually appear. There was something about that character that just appeared with the makeup. Towards the end of that photo shoot, I started to find his physicality and I started to understand who he was a bit. Natalie was amazing. She made this extraordinary beard. And then the first time we put it on, it was so heavy. None of the, the spirit gum that they normally use to hold the beard on would hold it. So Natalie devised a system where it had wires that went across my head to hold it up and then it was glued and then they put the bald cap over the top of the over the top of the wires and putting the teeth in really sort of just put the cap on uh, and it helped me to find the voice as well i i had a mouthpiece that went over my teeth we kept losing them <laughs> so they were stuck in with super glue which uh, occasionally bled into my mouth just a little bit yeah, tasty. <laughs> now, if we don't reach our goal through Kickstarter, in all likelihood, we're going to have to drop Trollbridge completely. It's been overhanging our heads for the last eight years, and it's either time to get this baby made or time to move on, which is honestly going to break my heart. So much time, love, and effort has already gone into it, but we have done everything we possibly can at Snow Gum's end to see its fruition. And now, it's completely over to you guys, 100%. My name's Daniel Knight. We've been Snowgum Films. Trollbridge is for you. Thank you so much for your time. Help us to realise our potentiality. A troll isn't just for old lodge. Shut up! That was really the turning point for the film. Um, if, if that campaign hadn't have been successful. Um, I, I, I don't know what would have happened, but I don't think it would have been terribly good, and I don't think um, we'd, we'd be having a film anywhere near like what we're now you know, working to deliver. And over the next few weeks, money started pouring in. And by the time it closed, he had $78,000 in there, including $1,000 from Terry's agent. Um, and, and we had a really nice spike in the last month um, and it took us up to a, about $85,000 um, and that was brilliant. I believe um, at that point it was the highest uh, crowdfunded short film um, and I think it's still in the top one or two. And it's also not just about the money, it's also about the fact that suddenly you know there's a lot of people out there who actually want to see that movie made. So that gave us quite a bit of wind into our sales. So I was very, very, I feel very fortunate that we've been able to, to extend Trollbridge and actually make it the film that it was always intended to be through the, the Kickstarter campaign. Thank you once again for supporting us all that time. Thank you. I've always taken as a touchstone for this sort of thing the first Conan movie. Yeah, for sure. It relied on very little... I mean, it, it put an awful lot into making certain every piece of leather look like someone had sweated into it for ten years, and, and using natural scenery as much as possible. Yes. So once the campaign uh, had been completed and we, we raised eighty five thousand dollars, that kind of changed the dynamics uh, a little bit, and we suddenly realised, okay. Well, we've got a little bit of extra money now. What would be the best way to apply it for the film? And one of the obvious ways that we thought we could do it was by uh, taking a, a small uh, section of the crew over to New Zealand to get some exterior shots over there. Um, we were going to get much bigger vistas, a much more expansive environment that was going to match what we wanted to do. The, the fact that that money came in just really resulted in fantastic footage that it, every cent of that went on fares and you see it on the screen. When we were coming through the airport though, the, the people were like, why have you got swords and axes and things? And we're going, we're making a film. And they went, oh, no problem. Because they're so used to the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit people coming through all the time. But they were a bit concerned when we first arrived and then it was like, oh yeah, no worries. So we went over a week earlier 
and we pretty much traveled all the way around Queenstown. We explored it as much as humanly possible. And always in the forefront of the mind was, where can we get the horse? Where can we get the horse? I was making a television show uh, at the time and we were in post and so right in the middle of that there was a snow dump in New Zealand so we decided to go, uh, have very little notice. We put a small crew together, threw them on a plane and uh, went over to uh, Queenstown for about uh, two and a half days for uh, some pretty frantic filmmaking to be honest. It was a very very quick and very uh, mobile exercise but you know we, we got some fantastic stuff out of it. I'd never used the camera before I was uh, reading the manuals to the camera on the plane um, <laughs> while we were heading to New Zealand. We got there we did a recce like that <laughs> night uh, and then we shot the next morning. Um, it was absolutely insane. It's not easy just to be thrown out there in the middle of nowhere and try and get these shots. You're at the mercy of weather. We'd had snow dumps just before. You're at the mercy of potholes when you're trying to follow a horse walking along the road. And I think sometimes a few bumps in the shots are saved by the fact that you've got New Zealand in the background and it's like, well, New Zealand's kind of picking up the slack every time we run through a pothole. So. What was it like being out in those snowfields wearing next to nothing? Fucking freezing. <laughs> <laughs> it was August in New Zealand on top of a mountain in a jockstrap. So basically there wasn't, wasn't a lot to keep me warm. I got into the makeup, put on a big heavy coat that we had made that had hand warmers sewn into the inside of it. Didn't you have heat packs in your underpants? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I may have had heat packs in my underpants and, and in Some my boots. Some specialist costume design there. And I think I've still got burns, burn marks from where some of them may have overheated a little bit. Dylan, we shot in two other locations. Uh, one of those locations is called Arrowtown, which is a old mining village outside of Queenstown. The other location we shot in New Zealand was Paradise. Uh, so the sequence where Cohen is riding away from the bridge is actually in a place in New Zealand that is actually called Paradise. So all the sequence right at the tail end of the film was shot uh, on a giant riverbed which I understand floods in the spring when all the snow is melting off the mountains. But we were there when the snow was still frozen and up so we could walk along this wide expanse of gravel and that's where we shot the, the second half. It was beautiful. The wind was blowing an absolute gale. I've never been so cold in my life. It was freezing. But we were walking across and the beard was going horizontal because <laughs> the wind was just like this. So I, I sort of had to grab it and hold it. So if you see, I've got the horse with this hand and that I'm holding the beard with the other hand in place. It was all incredible, but the most impressive part was obviously at the last minute, uh, we finally managed to wrangle one hour in a helicopter. Um, and so I got up at, at four in the morning, drove out to this place where they had the helicopter. Um, they rigged it up for me. They lent me this giant, beautiful lens for the occasion. We took Don out and just sat him on a mountaintop and went around him 20 times and picked him up again and went to another mountaintop. They landed, put the coat on, warmed up a bit. We flew off to the next flight. I, I must admit, there were moments in my mind, though, where I was watching the helicopter flying past going, please do not crash that helicopter because I have no idea where I am. I have no idea which way Queenstown is. And, yeah, I, I'm not going to last long. You've got your little screen and you're just looking at it saying, this is gorgeous, this is beautiful. And as soon as you stop looking at the screen, you realise you're halfway out of a helicopter. The, the wind would it just run straight up the mountains. And so you'd just go over a hill rise and you'd be hit by this updraft and the whole thing would lurch uh, 100 metres to the right. And um, yeah, your stomach kind of went with it. And at the very last moment, we'd, we'd exceeded our time. We had an hour, we, we were up to 90 minutes and it was like, oh, they're going to call it, uh, they're going to cut us off now. And they said, is there anything else you wanted while we're here? <laughs> Didn't have anything else to do today, why not? Which is incredibly generous of them. And Tim said, well, I don't know, something different. He said, what about a valley? He said, valley's good. So we flew down into this valley which had 100 foot high cliffs with a, a river running through the bottom of it. We found a lovely bend. 
sat Don down and said, Don, walk along and pretend you're talking to a horse. Uh, and we went back away. And I was really worried because it was the last shot um, we were going to get. And I was pointing out of the, uh, the uh, chopper sideways. Um, so I was seeing mainly wall. Uh, and so I said to the, the, uh, the pilot, I said, look, I'm, I'm not getting really great stuff. I've just jammed in this canyon. He says, no worries, mate, I, I've got you. I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't leave you staring at a wall. And he turned the helicopter sideways. <laughs> the whole perspective changed and he was shooting down the valley. And so I was sitting in the front watching a wall go past me. And so was the pilot. And he was just like, he was so cool, so calm. And the entire run is done, him just basically reversing down uh, <laughs> this canyon uh, at about four metres off the water. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's moments like that. All I could think about was, God, let the batteries hold. <laughs> I, mean, I, was just... I mean, now you watch the movie and you're like, oh, nice drone footage, but you gotta see, there was no drones back then. There was helicopters, old school. So... Um, I think part of the way that we have attacked this film is to kind of have a, an idea about what it's going to look like as a whole, but then very much focus on biting off the next bit, bite that bit, bite that bit, bite that bit, and literally just keep pushing it forward. There's a lot of people at stake, and, and I dare say if you grabbed, you know, the producer and the director separately and said, why are you doing this? And they go, ah, just for them, really. And the other one would go, mm, just for them, really. But as long as they never have that conversation, it does go on. So I think it's tantamount to both Dan and Aaron who has basically been his mother throughout the whole thing. Um, and how he's remained sane is beyond me, but uh, he's done a marvellous job. While there's love for the project that would drive down after 10 years, it's just gotta be the sheer bloody mindedness that once you put that much into one thing, you can't ever just stop, you, you have to finish it. The Chinese water torture, I think, is, is Dan's, is Trollbridge for Dan. He would have been lying in bed and this fucking drip on his head, Trollbridge, 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 Troll, until he did it. And I think the point of no return was about three or four years in, um, and uh, after that, it's just, no, you just gotta get it done. So like I said earlier, when it's done, I don't know what the fuck he's gonna do with his life, but hopefully he'll be able to go on and do some other stuff and just relax and just, you know, forget about the whole Trollbridge thing. But I think it's tantamount to his passion um, his professionalism and his doggedness to not let go of something that he really, really wanted to do. It, to me, the project is an avalanche and it's just constantly running ahead of that avalanche not to get completely snowed under. In England, you know, you could have taken your pick. Of bridges as well, probably. Oh, bridges, and not far away from me is, is Old Wardour Castle. You've got everything, you've got, you know, you've got your winding staircases and all sorts of stuff, and a lot of it's open to the sky, so the light's good. Um, Britain, you know, Australia, the, old, the oldest building material is um, corrugated iron. Yeah. <laughs> the bridge really is the third character in this whole thing. It has to convey the dangers, but also the age. It needs to be, at a glance, you need to be able to see where we are, or imagine to be in this particular world. The bridge sets the world. There's a very, very large bridge that needs to be considered and for that, uh, putting my designs in the third dimension by making a full-scale miniature, as well as sets, um, we're gonna make a lot of skulls we have to fill up Death Bridge. So we need, uh, we need a very large warehouse and we need to hire it out for uh, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe even a month. Um, there's also some very large amounts of uh, construction materials to actually build the set, but um, this is a big scale production. That's really where the money is going at the moment, is on the, the physical aspects of uh, constructing the bridge, building it, and then shooting in it.
Rob McKenzie, came in to help us. He's worked on Narnia, he's worked on big production films as construction. That's, that's what he does. We could show the drawings, he would go, oh, that, okay, that's easy. That's obviously like a 1200 by 100 thing where we would just go, oh, I, we, we, we were just scribbling something. But he could actually turn it into something that could actually happen and be built. So I've been helping build the troll bridge. Um, so casting skulls in plaster and doing all the mortar work and lots of painting and just learning so much from really amazing people. So that's... It was quite a big ask because there was quite a, a lot of people involved and they were working for free or they were working in their spare time to keep everyone motivated and coming in and doing things. And there was everyone who'd been on it from the start but there was also like uh, work experience people who would come in and help us. Yeah, we were, we were pretty lucky to get everyone involved that we did. We are now in a position where I can jump onto it full time um, to not being paid still, of course, but um, just having the funding there to actually make all this stuff rather than waiting for things and having the source has been an absolute dream. The first thing we'll, I guess we'll look at is this beautiful skull wall. We had a lady in one of our volunteers, Liz Dow, she came in and cast out hundreds of skulls for this non stop. Originally, for the, for the war scene, we had a, a sword that was made by Jonathan Lyons. Now, since he's become older in this portion of the film, we have aged it. <coughs> so as you can see, it's been quite banged up and, and aged. It did used to have a big green uh, emerald here, and the, the eyes had um, precious stones in them as well. As, um, he's lost most of his money and things, so he's, um, he's actually pried out all the precious jewels to um, you know, spend on drinking women and soft toilet paper, <laughs> things like that. This guy was a, the original Hero Corpse prop head, however it was deemed too creepy and sort of real mummy-like and too scary. Some saddlebags created for Colin the Barbarian's horse. These props are just basically revamped old bags. Colin the Barbarian's toilet paper. It is a book, fan, a well-known fantasy book that has been um, uh, obliterated. Instead of a nice soft rug going around it like a, a warmer, it's uh, chainmail. I've got, again, Emily McGregor's work. She sat there and fletched like 10 of these, I think. Again, we just don't have enough room on this bridge. It fills up really quickly. Cohen the Barbarian's walking stick. This was a pretty random find. Micra and family's milk bottles with their milk water form. Fiberglass and wooden axe. Basically, it's like a table leg that's been aged. A um, whole bunch of leather. Work done by us as well. This is made out of fiberglass with rust effects and whatnot. And it took us probably uh, about an hour to create that one. The biggest challenge with this set is trying to show it off in all its glory. Um, it's such a beautiful piece of art that you want to make sure that all of that brilliant work is on is on screen. So getting shots that really sort of show it off and um, really get you feeling like you're up at the top of a mountain and uh, that there's just miles and miles of space around these guys and really feeling that epic size of, uh, of the bridge itself. Hi, my name is Jess McKenzie. I'm second AD and we're at the Wicked of Oz. Where are you shooting? Uh, Trollbridge. The Melbourne shoot was a, a bit of a blur, but a very good blur. It's actually one of my... Um, I don't know how everyone else remembers, but it was one of my favourite memories on set. Uh, I remember the vibe being really good. We were getting to the meat of the story and we had a real set that looked like we wanted to. We had a horse on set. We were getting through the, the actual story. We'd done, you know, fights and we'd done mountains and we'd done all this stuff. This was the meat of the film and we were finally getting to it. Building the bridge was like getting together with some mates and making this huge art installation. So that was a lot of fun. And then once sort of the rest of the crew and the actors and everything started coming in, it started sort of evolving and shaping and all the layers just sort of coming up and up further. Hearing the actors like say their lines, we've created a world and they're like breathing life into it. So. Working hard, it's hard to sort of stop and take stock of what you've created or get ex even get excited about it so coming in today it's yeah really feeling the groove and the getting a bit emotional with it because it's you know the love it's, it's been our passion project for so long it's just it's happening you know it's <laughs> been kind of cool uh, I'm I'm Jake I'm the data wrangler on set today and also this guy here with the clapper so I'm pretty much the most important person here nothing can happen until that has come down. Um, I'm in charge of the camera, basically. Um, 
I work with my intrepid camera department, who is sitting next to me, um, and with the group guys who are currently stacking things up over there, and with the lighting department who are, I don't know where they are, but um, we run the cameras and the lights and um, shoot all this beautiful art and wonderful actors and incredible scenery that people have spent months preparing. Yeah, we just walk in at the last moment. At the last yeah, moment. Yeah. And hey guys, yeah, sprinkle, we're ready. sprinkle some fairy <laughs> dust over everything, <laughs> make it look sparkly, yeah, take all the credit. That's, that's the joke. And uh, we are on set here at Trollbridge, and we've got a bit of extra time at the moment, because as usual we're just waiting on the grips to get their shit together. And um, yeah, so um, what are we up to? <laughs> Um, we are using the latest iteration of uh, Red's digital cinema camera, the Red Epic. It's a uh, full 5K resolution, which is great for our visual effects stuff. We shot this stuff in New Zealand in 4K, but because this is mostly green screen stuff with a lot of uh, CG characters, that little bit of extra resolution is really going to help the visual effects department do their magic. So um, I actually went to high school with the uh, visual effects guy and I uh, remember him talking about it many, many years ago. And uh, lo and behold, 11 years later, uh, here we are. <laughs> Got my boom operator here. Mm. He swings around the pole that has the microphone on the end of it. You two sound pretty close. This, yeah, well. There's love there. We've known each other for a while. Mm. What's back here? <laughs> Black. Black. Shut up. <laughs> Three days, shots all done, nice. handing over to the boss for checking. <laughs> Thank you, boss. Boss. Hi, I'm Daniel Knight. I'm the director of Troll Bridge. Like that? <laughs> that I'm the producer's mum and uh, working on the theory that he's the one that's going to be selecting my nursing home in a few years, so I'm helping him out. Has anyone spoken about the catering? The no. catering was phenomenal. You know, people say, you know, if there's no money, at least the catering's good. You'd pay for this. Like, this was excellent catering. Really good. Like chili con carne, lasagnas, mm. everything. Hot meals, cold meals, lukewarm meals. What she had wanted? Yeah, everything. And this one pales in significance to the one where there was a hundred cast and crew out in a paddock for three days. Good challenge, like a challenge. No, I would actually like to make a, a, a formal thank you to Aaron's mum, because that catering was phenomenal. Yeah, Wicked's fantastic and we love it, but it's not the ideal. It's not big enough, the green screen's too close, um, it's a bit cramped. And it's uh, the biggest shoot that I've ever done in terms of lighting setup and how much crew I have and I'm very fortunate to actually have a best boy who's a qualified electrician and I'm like getting excited I'm like all right this is the first time I've worked with the green screen what do I need to do okay and I researched and I'm like all right I need about five meters in front of the green screen before we have anything going on so I can put the lights there so they could hit the screen and I walked into the studio and, and I looked at the set and I went oh my god uh, there was about half a meter between the wall and the set on one side and a couple metres on the other side and I'm like, it's okay, we can work with this. <laughs> um, what we actually have are two tracks that run around the entire set up on the roof, uh, an external track for the green screen uh, and an internal track for the green screen lighting. The whole green screen, all the lighting can be moved quite quickly and easily, um, especially because we're in such a confined space as you may have seen. So having the green screen on rollers, um, same with the lights, um, only takes a few minutes to move the whole lot around to the other side. My main role on set is to um, make sure that the special effects crew have what they need from each shot. And so I'd basically be looking over Daniel's sh shoulder most of the time, just getting what I think the visual effects guys needed in the shots um, as best as I could at the time with what we had, the space, uh, the lighting, the limited amount of green screen, the limited amount of lighting, to get the most out of it that we could. Obviously, as you can see. Oh, don't look at me, look uh, at the camera. Yeah. Oh, don't look at me. No. No, no, go. It's your talk. I'm just listening. You're the yeah, voice of the horse. Yeah, that's no, right. I'm not on camera. No, you, we don't Keep see you. To the side. No. Yeah. Well, technically, you don't see me either. No. I'm, um, I'm just a computer graphic. I'm not even a real person, just a computer graphic. I auditioned at the Richmond Library, I think maybe late 2007, early 2008, because the script had in the audition notes, they're looking for Monty Python-esque characters and voices. And I wanted to do that. Um, so I auditioned for a lot of the big roles, didn't get any of them, 
ended up with blocks. Blocks had two lines. Who's blocks? Block. Yeah, anyway, he's not big character, but Blocks is he's there in that moment where everyone's sitting there and uh, I think uh, Leon Durr is, is drinking tea. Then Dan came up to me after that mm. and he goes, I love your comic timing. I didn't think there was any comic timing in it. Um, and he said, I want you to be the horse. So I knew on that shoot. Did you know there was a horse involved? No, nah, I had no idea. Never right. seen that part of the script. So when he said to you, I want you to be the horse, what ran through your mind? When a director offers you a job, you don't tend to question it. About five years later, I saw the script. No. Would you like to see my teeth? No. They're really lovely, no. they're Swarovski <laughs> crystals. <laughs> Beautiful. What don't you get? Sorry. No. Do you have a favourite part of your costume? Um, taking it off at the end of the day is the best part. It's three hours every day um, to get it on and an hour to get it off at the end of the day. A lot of this doesn't come off because it's, it's put on with ink. So it's a special, special inks. So they stay on so they, until you scrub them off at the end. And that's a loofer job. Turn around for Madonna. It's my brother. Put your head down. Yeah. It's getting there. Mm. You're yeah, getting there. Yeah, he's getting there. <laughs> I've been in a few of Dan's movies and it's not a Daniel Knight movie unless he's got me wearing something stupid. Whether it's just male armour, if it's a teddy bear suit or in this case, a fluorescent green skin tight suit. Now when Dan said that, okay, we want you to do the voice, I was really geared up, I was excited. I mean, I'd seen Andy Serkis get in his, his black one with his golf balls all over it. I was really keen to do that. He said, no, no, you got a green suit, that's it, so. This is what is known as the, um, the lizard suit, mm -hmm. the frog suit, right. the green toad suit, right. the green suit. Right. Basically so that they can take me out of the shot. Mm -hmm. Because obviously the troll is about eight feet tall, and I'm not. So they fashioned this, uh, this, this hat with two antennae and ping pong balls that sat up on the top of it too. So that when Don was talking to me, he could look up there. But the trouble was, every time I was moving, these things would go like this. <laughs> what are you doing? For about the first two days we started to use those, eventually it just got so idiotic, there was like, no, nah, just lose the hat. <laughs> lose the hat. And, um, and then Troy came in and absolutely nailed the wife. Am I allowed to say that? I've got, I've got to check my, my character's script. name's Beryl. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. I've seen you. Yeah. You're quite good. Yeah. Oh. I think mm. you should see your, see your face. I think you'd be a great... Yeah, do you think... See, I, I have a feeling that we don't actually need CGI. I've been looking at some of the rushes and... Um, I don't know how a computer could make it better, mm. basically. Your transformation into looking like a female troll. Yeah, just then you did it. Perfect. Now we'll take it off. Different guy. Wow. Actor training. How did you do mm. actor training? That was two years after we shot the stuff out in Black Lake. But I remember on the day of the shoot coming in, like the bridge set piece was finished and I looked at it and I got that same feeling again. I went, oh wow. And we were, I, you could tell that everyone had that feeling. We're going, this is awesome. But everyone's playing it cool as hell. You know, they're like, yeah, okay, uh, roll camera, action. Oh my god! You know, it's been going. Everyone's being really, really professional. Everyone's doing their job quickly, and um, I don't think I've ever been on a set where everybody's just been so switched on. So I think that's really good. We're, we're like, well, no, today, today, today's the most complicated day. It was always going to be the most complicated horse, day because we've got the grip and the horse. Yeah. We've got a horse in today. It's very interesting. Trying to work with the animals. Yeah. Lindy is filling in for uh, Mickey, who was the, uh, the horse we used in New Zealand. Uh, so far, Lindy is winning everyone over. We were also a bit worried because in New Zealand, the horse we had, Mickey, was a fabulous horse, but freaked out when he first saw me with the beard on. It was, you know, um, it's quite an odd look. For the, so the horse was a bit like, whoa. So I said to the wranglers, oh, it's probably a good idea if I meet the horse so that she doesn't get freaked out by the beard. And um, I walked out and she was just like, yeah, big deal. 
and I and I, and I walked out the and the guy who was with with the horse had Cohen's beard. And I went, oh, she'll be right. Yeah, she was pretty used to the look, which was fine. Oh, he's been doing horses on films for about 30 years, and I'm 65, and I've been doing it since I was 19. And we do other animals as well: kangaroos, camels, cows, sheep, birds, anything you like. The horse in Melbourne was a very old horse called Lindy, who's been in more films than all of us put together. When we were waiting to do a shot, she'd start to fall asleep. So I'd be sitting on her and I'd feel her head just sort of start dropping. But she'd been around so many film sets. So when the first AD called turn over, she would go, oh yep, yeah, okay. <laughs> yep. Okay, right, I'm right. And as soon as they called action, she was just there. It had been on sets before. It knew what it was supposed to do, and it knew that on every set it had a job. So it spends its time trying to find its job. In order to get the horse's head moving, the wrangler would sort of flick a little stick for it. And it found this way of realising that every time he did that was when some guy over there was talking. So she started, every time Glenn spoke, she would go <laughs> and move her head around. And then a, a, a few takes later, she started going <laughs> whenever Glenn spoke. We come out of one take and everyone goes, whoa. He goes, the horse moved every time you spoke. I was like, really? And we looked back and there it was, yabbering away. No peanut butter, no Mr. Ed. And I, I spoke to her trainer and I said, this is amazing, what's happening here? And she said, oh, she's figured it out. <laughs> the stone that we've put on to dress the um, set is, it's a polymer, you just add water to it and you've got a whole bucket of snow. So it just comes in big tubs like this, we've all pre-mixed, ready for the day shoot. And it's just, yeah, it reacts like real snow, really good fun stuff to work with. That snow was so precious. We, we didn't have any, they didn't have any more left. Like we used no. all of it <laughs> and it was, so we couldn't, like we, we, we would tiptoe across, we weren't allowed to cross the bridge if we weren't we were supposed to be there. Um, Certainly not allowed to take a dump on it. You were not allowed <laughs> to do that. So the trainer of the horse, so he was standing behind the horse, right? And uh, then it became clear why he was doing that. And uh, all of a sudden the horse lifted its tail and he went like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he caught pretty much all of it. All of it, yeah. it was, we were all like city slickers going horrified. <laughs> but amazed. I, think, I don't think I ever read a book and laugh out loud as much as when I'm reading Terry Pratchett. It's just, I can't read it, you know, with anyone else around. If anyone else is trying to do anything, I'm just like constantly interrupting with the... The laughing. What does uh, Terry Pratchett mean to you? Everything. The last nine years of my life, solely dedicated. Yeah, that's what he means. <laughs> what can I say? Just absolutely in love with the world, and yeah, it's kind of a part of who we all are. So this is a very big honour. <laughs> This has been one of the most amicable crews I've, I've ever worked with, I think. Everyone's really friendly and everyone's, um, apart from the team. Um, how, are you, how are you feeling? Good. <laughs> Very good. How long has it been to get to this point now? Uh, it's, it's eight years and 11 months. So, uh, uh, next month, um, the 23rd of next month, uh, will be nine years uh, since we were originally location scouting for Trollbridge. I thought it was a really good shoot, and I just had a lot of fun. Um, we got some really great shots, and Don was doing fantastic stuff, and... Uh, I don't know what else we would've got. <laughs> I don't know what else we would've got. I'm happy. I'm very happy. Excellent. Great. So, I, to I told you I'm a shit interview. Mm -hmm. Can I zoom in? Have a bit? Let's go. Guys, uh, that zoom's primed. Alright, say cheese. Cheese! Yeah, we just gonna get over the bridge. <laughs> 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 
so need to see this film finished. Uh, so I said, give, give another two years. Don't say that. You've got to make. That'll give it a ten don't years. Say, yeah, don't say that. Don't. Ten Are ten you recording? Film. Don't. Not don't ten say years. ten years to death. Edit it in three months. It's onward to Troll Bridge. to Troll Bridge. My hopes of Troll Bridge is it gets finished. Have you, um... Uh, I think that's a fucking fabulous hope. I don't think there's anything beyond that. <laughs> Normally, in visual effects, we have this production triangle where we say you can have it cheap, you can have it good, or you can have it fast. Pick two. Where will you be in ten years' time? I don't know where I'll be. I didn't know. I didn't think I'd still be fucking making Troll Bridge. That's for certain. Probably making Troll Bridge still. The trouble is, we weren't just cheap. We were having no money. Uh, we, everybody was volunteering. Um, literally nothing. So in our case, it wasn't really a triangle. It was more like just a line between good or fast. We just waited. I mean, it's been 12 years now, I think, so it's been a long, long time for this, for this thing. And I can only imagine, I mean, for us as actors, you know, we're dying to see it be released. But for Dan, it must be... Seriously, once it's, once it's shown, once it's on the, on the movie theatre and it ends, I don't know what Dan's going to do with his life. Like the, the whole project would only be worth doing if it's really good. So fast was also kind of out of the question. So we weren't really in the triangle we were smack in that corner of that we wanted to be as good as we can and we have just have to invest the time that's the only way to do it oh it's so frustrating for them i can imagine yeah. mm -hmm. but then again if they'd have done it all within a month or something and they'd have had not as good a movie but they'd have had a movie mm -hmm. which could have led to something yeah which is leading to something, except it's been 12 years leading to something instead of a month or two. We're just now getting finished shots in, and that's a shot that Dan envisaged 10 years ago, and I framed up four years ago, and someone's been working on for the last year to try and make it work, and someone animated it, and now it's finally... I feel like I just cut an awful lot of people out of the process, but... <laughs> it is the project where the sun never set. So many people work on it from Australia, over Europe, here in the US. Somebody was always working on the project. Every time I catch up with my parents or old, you know, I see my dad, he's like, when is that bloody troll movie coming out? <laughs> you have been talking about, I don't think it exists, mate. You know, there is no troll movie. You're just making stuff up. You're just, New Zealand's not even a real place. Uh, I swear, Dad, there's a troll movie coming and I'm playing a woman. It's great. You're going to be so proud. Uh, so for me, it's the, I think it's the waiting. The, oh, we're going to get there, you know. You know when you hear a word over and over and over and over again, it starts becoming meaningless? Like the word ear or nose for me, like nose, nose, nose. If I hear nose enough, it's like, what a stupid word. It doesn't actually make any sense, the word nose. I don't understand this word. That's Strawbridge for me. Well, I'm truly into my 30s now. Um, and for 12 years, it's it's been, you know, a big part of my life from the location scouting to the filming to the visual effects um, to starting over uh, <laughs> the location scouting the visual effects uh, the shooting um, so it's it's been a big part of my life but when that's all you've got to show for yourself creatively over the last five years and that's all I have we haven't done anything else we have stopped doing music video clips we stopped doing any other sort of content that should Troll Bridge be a failure, that's a huge fundamental risk that you're taking, um, not just as a career, but as a human being, because I've put so much of myself into it uh, that uh, uh, should it fail, the consequences I think would be quite devastating um, for myself. I'd give up filmmaking.
I reckon. I was actually involved in the original trial bridge um, that we did 10 years ago. I was a sorcerer of that. Uh, I then took on a different character for the, the, the war scene that was shot a couple of years ago. I was a uh, king in that one and now I'm the guy in the green suit. So in that 10 years I've played three different characters for this same movie and I haven't seen a bug at all. <laughs> so, and you're going to get very practically less and less as you've seen on the screen. Well, exactly. And now I'm not even there. <laughs> the, uh... I had a face in the other two. Now it's nothing. You know, they've really done a huge amount of work. And of course, you just want to see it finished. And I think it'd be wonderful it could be finished while Terry Pratchett still has all his cognition, bless his cotton socks. And I think it'd be wonderful for him. And I think that would really create a nice sort of a circle, a full circle. Well, if you'd asked me eight years ago if it was going to take eight years, I'd have said no. But you look at what Daniel has done with it, and Aaron, and you can see why it's taken eight years. Just a labour of love. What do you think Trollbridge will be when it's finished? <laughs> the um, how long did Ben Hur take? Um, the, the longest, shortest epic in the world, I think. I think, look, I think it'll be fantastic. I'm, I suppose, being involved from the very, very start of it, I'm as, as anxious as anybody else to see this, you know, go to, to completion. And I think it will truly be not only a massive labour of love, but I think it will actually be a very, very good piece of, um, piece of film. For so long, it was just a script, and then for so long after that, it was just uh, some battle sequences and then for so long after that it was just a few shots of mountains and then for so long after that it was just guys acting against a green screen. Uh, at this point it's actually starting to feel like it will be a film and um, it's, it's a huge relief and yeah we're still very very proud of it. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's suffered from, from taking this long, it's, it's still, you know, it's a good film. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's enough of a, a beat-up, but it, yeah, no, it is. Right.